Okay, The House of the Seven Gables is a comedy. Okay, not slapstick, but it's a comedy. And that means it has a happy ending. Okay, it's not a tragedy. Like the violent bear it away, it has a happy ending. In this case, the happy ending is signified, like most good comedies, with a marriage at the end of the book. Spoiler alert. There you go. Now it's always interesting when the book ends with a marriage. I'm front-loading this talk so that you understand this. Because um, when, a, when a book ends with a marriage, it usually means that the characters must be brought together. And in this case, the characters represent ideas, at least in part, or character types that need to be brought together. When a book ends in marriage, it is the marriage of two ideas. Generally, each of the characters has to change, adapt, in order to make the marriage a possibility. And Phoebe and Maul change and adapt over the course of the book. Phoebe gets a little sadder. Maul comes to appreciate the home. Marriages, when books end in marriages, or when movies end in marriages, are not insignificant acts. They end with promise. Right? It's nice to end with the actual wedding ceremony, or just before the ceremony, because as the old, old mill commercial used to say, it doesn't get any better than that. You have a promise of harmony and unity between two people. Generally, in movies, romantic comedies, and in books that end in marriage, it is not a good idea to get into the details of the marriage. That is, you don't follow them to the next scene where they're living together, where they're feeding the pigs, where they're doing the dishes. That's a different movie, a different kind of comedy. Right, but those details, they're messy. What you want to end with is a promise of something beautiful, not what do we do when the top of the microwave falls off? Which is what I'm going to be dealing with tonight. This is so unlike our wedding night, I will say to my wife. I'm going to fix the microwave. <laughs> right. The wedding night is great. <laughs> the day before the wedding is great because of the promise of harmony and unity. And that's how this novel ends. This is how Jane Austen's novel end, novels end. So any good comedy ends. The people who unite at the end are divided at the beginning. That's certainly the case in this book. Phoebe and Maul are apart. And the burden of our time together, as we talk about House of the Seven Gables, will be to understand why Phoebe and Maul are divided at the beginning to understand how and why things are divided at the beginning and what the implications of their lack of unity are. Okay, so that's our first task. As I say, you know, these things, uh, anyone who's a decent novelist and writes with a marriage at the end is really trying to say something about bringing something together. And Hawthorne is a decent novelist. All right. At the very least, he's a decent novelist. In fact, 
he begins the book by talking about what a novelist is. There's a little preface to this book. And let's talk about that just for a moment, okay? The main point of the preface is something like this. Novels are great. They are great because they help shape the sentiments of people. They teach people in an indirect way. You can preach to people, you can give them <coughs> rules, you can give them arguments, you can present a treatise on morality. And none of it will have the same effect on the human soul or the human sentiments as a novel some indirect, some insinuating way to shape the way people feel. Sentiment is where the action is. It gives rise to action. Sentiments, only sentiments, will shape, preserve the political community. Now, sentiments must reflect the proper understanding of the world. We act on our feelings, Luke, but our feelings can be better or worse. So a novelist who understands the world will properly shape sentiments, and a novelist who doesn't will misshape sentiments. So we ask ourselves two questions as we think about Hawthorne's account of what a novelist is. The first question regards feelings. How does the novel make you feel? The second question concerns the understanding. Does the novel make you feel appropriate? And that is the question of the understanding. Let us begin by talking about the house of the Seven Gables, the actual house. The house is part of the setting. So let's talk about the house. The house is old. It was built by a Puritan, Colonel Pynchon, right? And he built this house as a monument to his fame and wealth. He even made an order that his picture be hung in the library and never moved. That's someone who wants his legacy to continue. But as the story opens, the house is in disrepair. The last heir to the fortune of Colonel Pynchon is eking out an existence in the rotting timbers of the old family mansion. And in fact, Hepzibah, this last heir, is opening a penny shop to secure her living. And the significance of this, I think, cannot be overstated. This is very important, right? The family has fallen, right? The once proud family of the Pynchons has fallen. Or at least most of the family has. And not only that, it has fallen. Can we all agree with that? It's fallen, but it is literally not reproducing. Hepzibah, 
the last heir to the Pynchon dynasty, it seems, is what we used to call an old maid. A word that used to send shivers up the spine of many a sensible woman. The house is in shambles. The furniture is old and decrepit. The members of the family are impoverished or worse. Hepzibah has even taken on huh, a border <coughs> to help make ends meet. Hope I'm making it clear that this family has no future. The pensions have no future. Literally, there's no future. And the fall is remarkable. And it raises questions, doesn't it? The fall of a family like this raises questions. Why has the family uh, uh, why has this fall occurred? And how should the family respond to its fall? Those are the two big questions. Let's take these questions in order. Why has the fall happened? Why have the pensions gone down the pooper? <coughs> So in order to understand the fall, we need to understand the rise and the fall. How did they get there? Why did they fall? <coughs> so we need to ask the earlier question, why did the house get built in the first place? And we see when we look at this that the seeds of the fall were sown in the beginning. Colonel Pynchon built the house under very dubious circumstances. Let us think about this for a moment. The house is built where a commoner, Matthew Maul was his name, had set up a homestead. And he had set up a homestead where most people would do it at that time, near a well. So he would always have fresh water. The well was called Maul's Well, M-A-U-L-E, Maul, not M-A-L-L. -L. Colonel Pynchon tried to buy the homestead. He tried to get title to the homestead through legal means. Back in the day, But Maul wouldn't sell. So Maul was accused of being a witch. And Colonel Pynchon has contrives it so that Maul is ultimately hung as a witch. And after Maul is dead, the price of the land goes down. And he purchases the deed to the land for a song, as I would say. <coughs> now, Colonel Pynchon is a leader of the Puritan community, very respectable sort. And obviously, if he accuses someone of being a witch, that person's a witch. Or, I guess, a wizard, right? He can pull a few strings, perhaps, to make sure that justice is done in his case. Colonel Pynchon ends up looking a lot like, for those of you who have read The Scarlet Letter and remember it, Dimsdale, who is the preacher who has an affair with Hester Prynne, but always denies it. In other words, Colonel Pynchon is a great hypocrite. He always preaches law and order in the Puritan community, but he uses the law itself as a cover for his own theft. But to show that there was no hard feelings over the killing of Matthew Maul, 
Colonel Pynchon hires his son to build the home on the remnants of the old homestead. No hard feelings. Your dad was a witch, after all. Would you build my house? And the pay was good. I'm sure he wasn't just washing his guilt. But the cost of having a mall relative build the house was a bit steeper than the colonel imagined. We'll get to that in a second. Because it is from this point that the Pynchon family begins its long decline. He's opening the home. It has been built. There is a promise that land exists elsewhere. He has a deed to other lands. And the first in the series of unfortunate events that happens to the Pynchons, Colonel Pynchon assumes room temperature. It's mysterious how he dies, right? It's the day that the, how, the housewarming party, the house opening, the grand opening, the open house, the, per, the Pynchon estate, the house of seven gables. <laughs> And he goes into his study and dies in his chair. It's awesome. The second part of this decline <coughs> is that the malls have managed to take their revenge on the pensions. The revenge comes about in a couple of ways. But I'm just going to, uh, and, and, and the, the couple of ways uh, forces me to um, predict or assume what is going to happen later in the novel. So once again, spoiler alert. The malls had the map and the deed for the land that was in the east. And they hid the map and the deed behind the portrait of Colonel Pynchon, which he had ordered never to be removed. Of course, it's interesting that this problem is only revealed at the end of the novel. And by talking about it now at the beginning, it allows us to give a more comprehensive account of why this family has fallen. Right, so first of all, Colonel Pynchon dies. But the family always held out for the promise of a great estate in another part of the state. They always thought that if they could just find the deed, if they could just find the man, everything would be all right because their wealth would be secure. Wouldn't it be nice to discover that you own Meridian? What's that? That would be great, yeah. It would be great. It would be nice. So, they never work. They spend their time, insofar as they work, they spend it looking for the deed. But they never engage in productive labor, which they believe, as you can see from the account of Hepzibah opening the penny shop, is a bit beneath their dignity. The pensions are not workers. And they never find the deed, in part because of the pride of the owner or the founder of the family. He sees the house and the portrait of himself hanging in the library as a tribute to him. And the fact that it shall never be moved means the deed will never be found. It's covered up by his pride. And the third obstacle, or the third reason that the family has never been able to progress, is a certain vengeance at the heart of the Mall family. 
They recognize that this house is built on what is metaphorically the ashes of their family. And they seek revenge, not just once, but in every generation. Malls well, kind of gives off stinky water now. So these are the these seem to be the causes of the family's decline. Pride unwillingness to engage in productive labor on the one hand and successful vengeance on the other hand. Now I don't want you to think, I don't want you to get the wrong idea from what I'm saying. Hawthorne, I feel like standing up and stomping and making sure you hear what I'm about to say. Okay? This is important. Hawthorne is not anti-pride. Pride is a dangerous human passion, and it is a noble human passion. <clears throat> you ever say to someone, why don't you have some pride? Probably. Hawthorne is very realistic about human nature, I think, or this is the way he understands human nature. Um, pride is the source of many human ills. But there is no final solution to the problem of pride. You can't get rid of it, nor should you want to get rid of it. Pride goeth before the fall, that's an old saying, but there's no way to get rid of pride. There is, and I'm going to call it this, right, for the, for the rest of the novel, there is an aristocratic part of human nature. <coughs> there is a belief ingrained, bred in some people that they are better. And if properly tamed and aimed, that is a very useful and beautiful attribute <coughs> of human nature. And by calling it an aristocratic part of human nature, I want, to, want you to understand exactly what I mean. It doesn't depend on the existence of an aristocracy, nobles and serfs and kings. It's not dependent on the social arrangements. It is in human beings. You can get rid of aristocracy and you still have aristocratic pride. And just, I mean, there, there are countless examples, but our current president thinks he's something else, for instance. I don't think he's an aristocrat. Maybe he is something else. He, he, his pride has certainly given rise to great things. The ocean's receding. But democracies do not like pride do not like aristocratic passions. Okay, it's best to hide this. It's best to try to suppress it. Right, if you are proud, you might consider <coughs> disciplining yourself so you don't appear to be so proud. But even in democracies, people desire to rule. People want to rule because they think they are fit to rule. 
It used to be that they could come to rule only through the channels of birth. That was aristocratic social arrangements. Democracies open up the ambition and pride of all. We think that's one of democracy's great things. It lends activity and possibility and opportunity to all. And it is one of democracy's great things. But recognize what that does. It unleashes the aristocratic passion that human beings have. The belief that they are better. And the hope that they can get their fellow citizens to acknowledge their being better. Democracy has not solved the problem of pride. We will see later on in the book that there is another pension still around, Judge Pension. And he is just as proud and just as dangerous as his ancestor, Colonel Pynchon. But Judge Pynchon is very, very popular and beloved by the people. He knows how to make himself love. So Hawthorne is both anti-pride and pro-pride. It's dangerous and noble. And you can see that pride is really sewn into the decline of this family. I think that's clear. It's sewn into the decline of this family. But it cannot, and his position is not, well, let's get rid of it. His position is, let's harness it. Nor do I want you to think that Hawthorne is simply anti-revenge. has an element of justice to it. When you have been done a wrong, are you going to sit back and take it? Or does revenge itself have an element of pride to it? It is noble not to sit back and take it. So revenge is not a petty passion, it has an upside, a love of justice and the pride not to simply suffer. It's true that revenge supports petty grudges and actions. It's also true that when people say revenge is a dish best served cold, what they're saying that is it's best to govern your passion by reason, the cold and cool, deliberate sense of time. One should always seek revenge a long time afterward. <laughs> like this weekend when I was in Seattle and the referees cost us a game, I did not slash their tires, but I do have their address. <laughs> it's always best to at least appear cool when you're, when you're seeking revenge. Okay, so I'm just putting that all out there by way of qualification. Um, and you can see how these things add up, hopefully, from what I said earlier about marriage, um, which is to say there are things about the malls that would keep the families apart. There are things about the pensions that would keep the families apart, pride and revenge. But since neither of these passions are entirely without foundation or entirely um, vices, there are ways to educate them and create harmony between these two things. 
Each of them are founded on a, a, a different kind of, um, uh, I should say, each of them has an upside. Now, I think uh, as we go in our discussion groups this week, we're going to want to, uh, on Thursday, we're going to want to talk about uh, how the family has reacted to its fall and some of the other questions that will come up in the subsequent chapters. Um, and I will make up the ground uh, that we failed to cover today in the next lecture. So we'll see you all in discussion groups on Thursday.